Good morning, everyone. I talk about a very different topic, probably, that you're normally used to. It's about uh, engagement, actually. And we call this term gamification. I have been living in the Silicon Valley, San Jose, San Francisco area, for now over 13 years. I was originally with uh, a large uh, German software company here, SAP. They run, for example, your payroll <laughs> here, the software that's used, or, or if you are uh, 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 have to transport uh, you know equipment over to another country that's uh, running through SAP software for example I've been there for 15 years but this type of software is typically not really engaging you know think of Excel sheets working uh, that you have to fill out this huge tables on the other hand you play video games where you uh, use Angry Birds or Candy Crush or this kind of stuff and there you actually do exactly the same kind of work and there it's fun and that's what we're taking a little bit uh, look at of how this works, how motivation works, how this uh, goes on. So let's get started. This is the picture of a girl playing a video game. What can we see here? Emotion, right, what kind of emotion? Intensity, harassing, you said harassing. Ferocity, right, exactly, yeah? Uh, she looks really like she's engaged, yeah? Do you think she's uh, successful in what she's doing? She's killing, yeah? I, I would also say she is, she is, she's successful. She's beating the shit out of something. Yeah? <laughs> she's definitely successful with that. Is she uh, focused? Certainly. Uh, nothing can distract her at this moment. Um, is she relaxing? No, no. She's, she's working hard. So whatever she's doing, she's somehow up here with all her emotion and passion and engagement that she had. Now think of yourselves or your colleagues sitting in front of a computer screen and doing work-related stuff. How do the faces look like? Like this? No, certainly not. So we are probably somewhere like here, yeah? Uh, and she can play here for three or four hours and then realize, oh my God, I just started five minutes ago. It's now three hours gone, yeah? So how can we get our colleagues, our people from this here a little bit closer to where she is. Now this is a, a series of photographs that was done by Philip Toledano, a London based photographer. Here you can see this gentleman here, same interpretation of the face here. He's probably also very successful at the moment. Uh, you may even see much closer and much better of how hard he's working because he's really sweaty on his face. Yeah? So that's really, he's enjoying what he's doing. Uh, and if you're enjoying what you're doing, you also do a better job. And whoever you're serving for uh, also profits from that. Uh, what's with this gentleman? So he has probably a very dirty word on his lips. Yeah, it starts with M and ends with the R. Uh, not reading that here. But is he going to give up or is he trying again? He is certainly trying again. He's not being frustrated in the sense of, no, I stop. I don't like it anymore. I am getting this challenge. I'm getting up and rise to the occasion. A question to you, what do you think is the average age of a video game? Is it uh, 14 years? Is it uh, 27? Is it 37? Or is it 54? Who says 14 years? 27 years? Mm -hmm. 37 years? Uh -huh. 54 years? So as it turns out, the average age of a video game is 37. If you are uh, watching Hollywood movies, you may think it's a 14-year-old pimple boy who is this kind of uh, playing alone in the basement, uh, obese, overweight. Uh, no, actually it's 37. There are a couple of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. When was the first video game? When did the first video game came out? Any guesses which one was the first video game? Pong, Pong, good one. And that was when? 79, 80. Earlier, actually, 1972. Yeah, really. So this gentleman here wasn't even born. So when he was born, video games were always here. And as it turns out, the 54-year-old were teenagers back then. So they were exposed to video games at this age. And 25% of all people, over, of, of all players, are over 50 years. Uh, there's a second reason for that. The uh, organization that collects this data, the Entertainment Software Association, looks, of course, or look in the past mainly at uh, video game, that video game console. That means it's, these games that cost 60, 70 bucks, yeah? And these are the people who can afford that stuff. 
I did, of course, of course, what we've seen with the advent of uh, mobile devices, we have a lot of youth playing video games. 97% of all the youth are playing video games. And when they come to the workforce, they have played 10,000 hours of video games. 10,000 hours, what does it mean? At the experts, mastery level, yeah? If you've read the book, Malcolm from Michael Cagwell, uh, Outliers, then you know those people are experts. If you play in the National Football League, you've played and practiced 10,000 hours of football. If you play the violin in the symphonic orchestra, you have played it 10,000 hours. Bill Gates, when he founded Microsoft, he had 10,000 hours of programming experience at that moment already. And they are expecting these experiences, this immediate feedback. Uh, they can read the language. They, they know of how to deal with these user experiences that are there. Now, it's not just a boys thing, yeah? In the traditional games, we had in the past this um, ratio of 60% male versus 40% female player. Now this gap uh, becomes smaller and smaller. And in social and mobile games, we actually have a majority of the players are women. They may not consider themselves as video gamers, but they play like five minutes Candy Crush somewhere or waiting here, there's somebody smiling guiltily here. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but it's, it's even balanced. So we have both genders playing video games. So this is a, a picture from some soldiers uh, deployed overseas and they're playing video games as well. So the most popular games that these uh, soldiers play when they're back in their barracks from the tour or from, from their, their daily duties are Halo and Call of Duty. What games are those? Huh? Shooting, war games, shooting games. So let me translate that for you. Real soldiers serving in the real army, fighting a real war, come home and relax by serving as virtual soldiers in the virtual army fighting a virtual war. I'm not sure about you, but when I come home, I'm not calling some customers or do some expense reporting just to relax. Yeah? And we need to understand what makes video games so attractive, so engaging. I want to show you. seen here is a gamified advertising campaign by a Coke uh, starting uh, the launch of Skyfall. So this mundane task of just buying a Coke bottle uh, becomes suddenly into a, chain, in a challenging story and a story that creates this imagination and suddenly people are 
you know, running behind, running after something, uh, and becoming engaged into in something. And these are little elements. These are game design elements that they use. They use story. They use a narrative. They use challenges. Yeah, challenge. Challenge is an interesting one as well. Uh, if you think of a game such as golf, what is what is the purpose of playing golf? What what do you try to accomplish there? Play against yourself. Is this the goal of golf? To get the to get the ball in the hole. That's basically already it. Yeah. So why don't I just take the ball and just drop it in the hole? Yeah? Would this be a fun game? Yeah. <laughs> Some people do. Yeah. <laughs> right. The cheaters. Right. Uh, but but a, a total opposite. We actually put up challenges. We say, no, you can't do this with the hands. Yeah? You have to use this stick, this, this club. And then we put you know, ro uh, rocks and uh, lakes and grass and trees and everything in between just to make it harder to do that. And suddenly it becomes fun. Yeah? People actually like challenges. And that's what we've seen a little bit in this video here. Now, what, what is gamification? Does, this, does gamification look like this? No, that's actually a game. Yeah? But uh, you may know this website, LinkedIn. Did you know that this is a gamified website? So I show you a couple of design elements that they're using in order to get you to share more information or come more often with them. Yeah? You may remember when you created your LinkedIn profile and it says 40% of your profile is complete and you start thinking, how can I get this up to 100? And then you start sharing more information there. Uh, then gamification is, this, is the way to go. It helps you to nudge people into changing their behaviors, into doing a little bit more, sharing more information, doing things in a timelier manner, doing things faster, helping more, being friendlier, etc. Amazon is a similar thing. Amazon is also gamified. It says when you search for a book or for a product, it says only three items left in stock and so Damn, if I don't buy it right now, somebody else will get it. So I buy it. Orbits, these travel websites also say, two people are currently looking at this hotel room. <laughs> I don't get that, I'm sleeping on the street. So I buy it right now. And actually 30% more people buy that uh, when they come to that. So when we look at games and work, we see that there are a lot of similarities. We have tasks, feedback, goals, path to mastery, rules, information, we have failure, we start as of users, promotion, collaboration, speed, risk, autonomy, we have narratives, and we have obstacles. So tasks are repetitive. Yeah? So when you look actually at angry birds, what am I doing there? Slingshotting some birds at pigs. Yeah? It's a fun game. I mean, a billion people cannot be wrong huh? who download the game. So when you look at it, what I do is I'm actually doing always this kind of movement. Yeah? Putting the bird in the slingshot and slinging it. Yeah, that's it. Looks from your side pretty dumb, right? Yeah? And dull. But for me, it's really fun. Now imagine yourself doing something similar on an Excel table. Yeah, or some other software that you're using. Yeah, or some other task that you have to do that are really dull. Um, now, what's the feedback that I get? Do I get feedback at Angry Birds? What kind of feedback do I get? Instead, I get points, I get score, right? But do I play Angry Birds for the points? Do you play Angry Birds for the points? Coming to the next level, yeah. But actually, what, are, what else feedback do we have? What other feedback? Stars is one, yeah. I get animations, I get visual feedback. I get these balloons exploding, the pigs exploding, the structures cr uh, crumbling, yeah? the monkeys flying around, etc. cetera. Uh, and I get audio feedback. I hear my own birds cheering me up. I get the pigs. If I'm not killing them, they're trash talking me. They're there like, ha 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 ha. Yeah? I get your mark, yeah? And then I try it again. So I have feedback constantly. When I play some other games, I have even a force feedback uh, that I get. You know, the, the, the controller rattles in my hand. Uh, now, think of work. When did you hear last, the last time I thanked you? Can anyone remember that? It's a sad story, right? You're not the only ones. A lot of other companies, other people also don't get this feedback, really, because we have not institutionalized it. Yeah? But feedback, we need feedback. 
because only then we know of how well we are doing. We may be you know, hearing feedback once a year, you know, like performance reviews that we get, yeah, or sitting with our supervisor and talking to him or her, yeah. But I hear things about what I've done nine months ago. I already forgot of how exactly have I done that, so I cannot improve actually. So how fun would Angry Birds be if I learn only three months later that I killed the pigs? This would not be a fun game, right? The next one is uh, that I want to go is the promotion. So in a game, I always kind of know of how to level up, what I can learn about how to level up, how to become better. How, when I see a level 70 player in uh, World of Warcraft, because of the dress or the weaponry that this, this, this character has, I know I can also achieve that. And I know that there's a way to go then I can learn that while I see that and I really understand that. Now, at work, do you know how you become, you know, rise up in ranks exactly? How to become a supervisor? Yeah, is there something that says like uh, you write that paper and then 10,000 downloads later or, or anything or whatever, uh, you, you rise up to this next level? You don't, yeah? You often know it's can, hmm. it's often knowing whom you know and whom you can kiss up, so to speak. Yeah. So it's a, a much unfairer system the way it is today. Now let's get into some definitions. So we are talking when we talk about gamification of games, we also take a talk about play. So play is this kind of unstructured thing. It has no goals, it has no rules, yeah. And you know maybe these situations where you select this, you know, carefully select this, this, this great game, yeah, this great toy, and then the child plays with the box it came in, yeah, uh, and uh, has this fantasy. So play is manipulation that indulges curiosity. Play is not just limited to humans. Play is something that animals do as well. So this is a picture of a polar bear who after hibernation came out, and for two weeks, he came to this polar station with the scientists and the huskies were outside and he came to, to play. You know, this guy, this guy just woke up from his hibernation, he's hungry, he couldn't get to this uh, place where he is, uh, you know, the, the lighter sea lions and the seals are that, he, that he's gonna eat up. Uh, but he waited and instead of eating those, those, those folks, uh, he just went and played. Play is something extremely important. We also know that goats are playing. Actually, 85% of all animals who die uh, as pups uh, die while playing. Seals die while they are playing, etc. Uh, as it turns out, play is something so important that <clears throat> it actually makes us understand who is a friend and who is a foe. Uh, by researching murderers in uh, uh, jails, uh, we could figure out, uh, research, the researchers figured out that those people had not enough play time in their childhood because if you're roughhousing a child, if you're playing with them, you give them basically a signal of where ends the fun and where does the, the, the seriousness start. Yeah? And those people who are in jail or animals who have never enough, who were deprived of play time, cannot distinguish between friendly behaviors and uh, and enemy behaviors anymore. This is a game. The game has rules. The game has a goal, namely to enter the game normally. Yeah. Uh, there's a certain number of players in there. The number of players is not changing typically. There's an outcome. The game is a problem solving activity approached with a playful attitude. This is a serious game. A serious game now is a little bit different from a game. A game is mainly here to entertain people, to entertain the players. But a serious game, the primary purpose is not so much to entertain, the, the, the primary purpose is to teach a skill, such as you know, being able to lead a conversation or negotiation or uh, learn, I don't know, surgery, uh, or learn how to use a weapon. A serious game is a game designed for the primary purpose other than entertainment. Simulations, you may be very familiar with those, are now these uh, initiate imitations of the operation of a real world process. Per se, they are not gameful. But of course, I can put in a gameful approach by saying, okay, now that you understood all the, 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 the controls, now we do a dogfight. And suddenly it becomes a game. So when we look at the distinction between play game, serious game, simulation, and gamification, 
we see that some of them are spontaneous, uh, some of them have rules, goals, are structured, have a real world outcome, and are in system. Simulations and gamification tend to be in the system, the others are out the system. What I mean with that is LinkedIn is in the system. Amazon is in the system. The simulation of a flight simulator could be also in the system. So what is gamification now? Uh, we engage, we teach, we entertain, and we try to measure people. For example, if you want to recruit them uh, for certain aptitudes, skills, etc. We change behaviors, we create habits, we give feedback, we teach, engage, entertain, measure. We care about the player's interests and motivations. We allow the player to experience a gameful state for the benefit of the player, but also for the benefit of other stakeholders, like customers, like the organization. It's not about competition and enables fun. Gamification is not about building a game. So we empathize with people by adding gameful experiences to work and life, by helping people to fulfill their interests and motivations for the benefit of all involved parties. Or as I say, make work more fun. So that, that's an interesting uh, commercial that we see here. Um, first, what have you seen? What was the goal here when these people, when the people, what, 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 did, what did these people have as a goal? Curiosity? I know. What's going on? Exactly. So, so first, first, let's start. They didn't have any goal. Yeah? It looks like it's Paris actually, the evening, summer. Uh, people just probably had some good dinner. They're just walking around. They yeah. uh, have no goal. They just relax. Yeah, and then they see something. Somebody already mentioned curiosity kicks in. Because what did they see? Bikes, stationary bikes, or as we call them, familiar user interface. Yeah, so they knew what to do here. Was there was there somebody standing there with a 60-page manual telling them, hey, hey, this is what you know? It was a familiar user. Interface. And then, what happened then? And the others observed, and they noticed they got, they got first uh, a visual feedback, right? They saw this line coming up, these lights going up. And then came audio feedback, yeah? And then the people realized, okay, we have to kind of collaborate, uh, work together to make this happen. And suddenly, they had a goal, and what was the goal? To get the guy naked, right? Exactly, yeah, right. Uh, wonderful, yeah. Get the guy. Did they succeed with that? Not really. Not really. They had a suitable substitute. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you call it. So they, they, they said not really, but he was naked, right? Yeah. Easter eggs, yeah. So, so, so they, they didn't see the crown jewels. That was not the girl. But. 
but this, they reached some other goal. And that other goal was what? They lost burned calories, they got fitter. Yeah? So now imagine yourself, you're walking around after dinner yeah? and somebody says, hey, hey, you want to lose 2,000 calories? Yeah? They say, the f off, I just had a dinner. Yeah? Yeah? But indirectly, they somehow managed that. Yeah? Indirectly, they gave them first this thing, get this stripper naked. Yeah? They did, but in fact, actually, they lost calories. And there was a third goal, of course, for the company. It benefited the company. They made more sales. The feedback was also immediate. Yeah, you saw immediate how you were doing. You also saw uh, people had to collaborate. So they came as individuals, but left as a group. Yeah, they worked together. So, so you see here this indirect way of motivating people to do something uh, that you think helps them. And really helps them because they become fitter. Now, <laughs> so this gentleman here, uh, he's ready for everything, right? Uh, he has a keyboard, he has a mouse, he has a headset, he has this three-dimensional graphic rendering engine called Window. Uh, and he's ready to tackle everything. But the biggest challenge that's probably coming every day is what? The neighbor's cat crossing the street. So that's how reality kind of looks like, yeah? not really entertaining. Let, let's go through some gamified systems that you have probably already encountered and used. And now you may understand also why, they, why you're hooked on them. Yeah. Frequent flyer programs. Who has a frequent flyer card? Safeway, BevMo, something like that. All these loyalty programs. Even if the airline is crappy, yeah, you're there because there are my miles. And even if you can't redeem them because they're always booked out, yeah? uh, and others are better because they are my miles. That's so addictive. That's so sticky. Or um, anyone using TurboTax? Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, just, just don't want to remind you. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't want to make it depressive right in the morning. Uh, so, of course, elements like this here, yeah, federal and California, where if I, you, you enter your data and then you see these numbers going up all the time or, or down, yeah, more, more often probably, uh, and you're sending nothing, mm, you are playing like a slot machine, getting these numbers up here. Yeah? And in 2012, after I filed, it actually had a pop-up that said, ka -jing, you did it. It really said, ka -jing, you did it. I was there like, great, can I do another tax return? Yeah? <laughs> uh, who sane would do that? That's, that's the power of what this system is doing. Yeah? Or if you drive or have driven, tried out an electric vehicle, a hybrid vehicle, you see these kind of things here. For example, here on this, on this Toyota Prius, you have your 62.5 miles per gallon, and I have friends who take pictures of that and upload that and brag on Facebook about that stuff. Yeah? Uh, or yesterday I heard from a friend of mine, her husband drives that, so he competes against his friends, and he doesn't allow her to drive the car because she would ruin his average. Yeah? <laughs> So, or, or here on the Nissan Leaf, yeah, you have these pedestals with even a trophy that you get uh, for driving well. Or here, here, this is the Chevrolet Volt. This has this little tube here, and if you hold this ball in the middle, you're driving fuel efficiently. If you're accelerating too fast, you know, burning rubber, uh, then you're wasting fuel. If you're braking too hard all the time, the ball falls down, you're also wasting fuel. Now, people are so focused on keeping that, that average here that they sometimes forget to break. <laughs> then they total their car, but the averages are still great. Yeah. Yeah. Fiat Ecoville does sim something, something different. Uh, everyone who's driving that car contributes in reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And that means then also that this village of all car drivers of that car saved so and so many kilograms or pounds of carbon dioxide. And it's equivalent for a couple of days of heating this whole town. And then a Ford, Ford has here these, these little leaves that are growing. So if you drive fuel efficient, you have leaves growing up there. Yeah? If you're driving not fuel efficient, they wither away, become ashes. Yeah? Now you would think, who gives, who gives a damn about growing digital plants? Yeah? Yeah? 82 million people played Farmville. Farmville is nothing else than what? Growing digital plants, right? And feeding chicken and all these kind of things, yeah? So this is something that people actually really enjoy because it's somehow like decorating, yeah? 
I decorate my home, I decorate my office space, so I also decorate digital spaces, like my laptop, like, uh, like my car. LinkedIn, uh, you have things like 95% uh, profile completeness or 28 people have looked at my profile this week, I must be important if so many people work at that. Yeah? And now, I'm from Austria, uh, I speak German, and my German colleagues, they're all smart asses. Uh, and they tell you, well, this is just the Americans, right? The Americans. Uh, no, the German version of LinkedIn, Xing, has the same thing, yeah? And they are even worse with certain <coughs> things, uh, what they're doing. So it's uh, across the globe, it works really everywhere. Amazon, we have mentioned quickly Amazon, so you have ratings, you have reviews. You have reviews, you have reviews. Uh, uh, you give feedback to a lot of different parties, reviewers, authors, uh, publisher, etc. Uh, or if you are doing uh, fitness apps, this one is Nike Plus. So you have a couple of game elements. For example, my average uh, mile that I run, my time. Uh, how was my run? Uh, I see challenges. I see I can challenge friends in other countries uh, and see who's running faster. At the end of the run, I hear the voice of an athlete, a famous athlete, Tim DeBow or whatever, uh, telling me, great job, hope to see you tomorrow again. Now that's a very technical approach, of course. Yeah. Uh, there's another application called Zombies Run. The story is you're living in a zombie-infested world and once a day you have to get out and get, collect food and batteries and all this kind of stuff. And once you enter the street and start that thing, you hear the voices of the zombies in the background. <laughs> if they're getting louder, they're coming closer, so you have to run faster. At the end of the run, you have these spikes in speed in between. That's how you should jog. That's using a narrative. The same problem with a very different game design element you apply. Now, why are we doing those things? Because we talk about engagement, and we also talk about what we call the engagement crisis. So Gallup, the Gallup Institute, has been polling for several decades now, hundreds of thousands of employees and corporations, and asking them about their engagement levels. As it turns out, in the US, only 30% of employees are really engaged. And engagement means here, uh, those who work with passion and feel a profound connection to their company, they drive innovation and move the organization forward. On the other side, we have 52% of people who are not engaged. They just do what they're being told. Yeah? And then the worst one are those who are actively disengaged. They actually sabotage the company. They, 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 they take money out of the company by you know, maybe misappropriating funds, doing other things, preventing things actively. Uh, if you think these are bad numbers, the US has actually the highest engagement levels. We go to engagement levels like China, 6%. Yeah? Germany has some in the range of 18%. So, so the Europe has around uh, between 12 to 20% of engaged employees. According to Gallup, we lose every year in the US alone between 350 and $650 billion because people are not engaged here. And we suffer all from that, as you know. You know, If you're on the phone with the call, uh, call center representative who is not willing to help you, uh, you are pissed about that. Yeah? If you go in a store and nobody helps you there, you're also not feeling well about that, etc. Now let's take a look at how effective is gamification, or can a gamification be? So this is uh, from the University of Washington. They had this problem. They're looking for, for uh, drugs that they can latch in order to fight diseases such as cancer or uh, AIDS. Uh, and in order to, to understand that these, these viruses are three-dimensional structures, and in order to find and latch a drug and fight this, this, this virus, uh, they need to fold that in order to find, find out certain uh, ways to, to build an effective drug. Now, they've done for like uh, over 10 years, 15 years, to solve that in a mathematical, computational way, to fold those structures. But they're so complex that they failed for a long time. Then they had this idea, somebody had this idea, well, isn't that a three-dimensional puzzle game? Let's do a game out of that. Well, they had a good laugh, yeah. Silly idea, right? Uh, but then they decided to go for that. 
once they launched the game, within 10 days, 46,000 players solved all the puzzles that they had not solved for the 50 years. The 46,000 players were not professors, were not students, were not these PhD assistants. No, this was the 11-year-old boy from Brooklyn or the 80-year-old grandfather uh, participating in that. Uh, or how do you get people to recycle more bottles? Uh, well, by making an arcade game out of that. So instead of having one hole, they built six holes into that with flashlights on top of that. And whenever this light, a, light, a certain light was lighting up, that's where you put the bottle in there. And then you earn points and had a high score. Now let me get this right. Uh, you couldn't do anything with these points. You couldn't take them home, you couldn't buy anything, whatever. You, there was no name of you on there that you created a high score. But 50 times more, more bottles were recycled at that one than one block afar from them. You've seen that example, 53% reduction in speeding cars. Um, or restaurants, restaurants are the largest uh, untrained, or waiters are the largest untrained sales force, so to speak, and they are not really getting feedback except through tips. So what they do is, they, uh, this solution tells you how much money per table you made, how much revenue you generated, and how much tips you got. Uh, and suddenly, because of these small pieces of information, the waiters were encouraged to serve better. A good waiter can add up to $9 to that. Because people are just comfortable, they order more. Yeah? They like you, they do more. Uh, a bad waiter deducts the same amount. Because people just want to get the hell out of the restaurant. Yeah? Um, so what happened is that three, over 3% 3 sales increase. And more important for the waiters, 11% more tips that they got. In total, in this restaurant chain, they had in that year $1.5 million more in revenue that they generated. And in a low margin business, such as restaurant, that can make or break your, 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 your business. Or how do you get people not to take the escalator? Huh? By making the stairs on the side a piano, look like a piano, and sound like a piano. So people are walking up. That 66% more people use the staircase. There's also a video online that you can watch. It's a lot of fun seeing them, really the old people with the canes and the dogs and the babies even going up and people jumping on the... And, and really not walking up and down, but just playing the piano. Uh, another example is uh, salespeople. So salespeople are typically commissioned, so for every deal that they close, they get a commission. Yeah? Um, now, in the system, in the CRM, in the customer relationship management systems, the managers didn't see all these activities that, this people, that other salespeople did. They call it event. So if you call a customer, if you meet a customer, that's an event. And they should report that so that management has an overview of how, how well are we doing, where are we going. Uh, so what they, what they did is they added points. For every event that you reported, you got a point. And suddenly it turned into a competition and it jumped from 50 to 85 reported events per week. Not only that, people called more customers just to get points. It was not about the commissions. It was about being on top of this leaderboard. Yeah. And the last example is uh, uh, with numbers that I show is about another call center. Uh, how do you get, you know, what's important is the, how long your customer uh, service representatives are on the phone. If they can get it, solve your problem quickly. Customers are more satisfied and you're ready for the next customer to serve. And they could, through a gamified training approach and giving them feedback on the site, on the, on the system, reduce the call time by 15% without sacrificing quality and increase the sales between 8 to 12%. So what would it take for you to not pee on the toilet seat? Mm, a lot. <laughs>
to the girls in the room. Uh, all the boys, shut up. Yeah, just for the girls. <laughs> what was the purpose of the pea falling into the water? Target. You have either a son or a brother, right? <laughs> I get this, I get this question a lot from women. I don't get the P in there, yeah. And well, here we go. Um, so what we've seen here is a son apparently not behaving in the right way. He's not lifting the toilet seat. Yeah. So the son, the employee, yeah, is not doing what the father, the the manager wants. Yeah. But the father, what could the father do? If you haven't seen this video, how would you have approached that? His son not lifting the toilet seat. Messing, make him clean the mess. He's an eight-year-old boy, of course, there's maybe more mess afterwards than before, yeah, right? What else? What other options? You could punish him, yeah. Send him, ground him, yeah. No ice cream after dinner, yeah, something like that. Uh, but if the father leaves, he's not here, same behavior probably again. You could supervise, yeah, standing behind him, yeah, making sure that he's lifting a toilet seat. Very time consuming for you, yeah. In Switzerland, they told me, oh, we just beat him, yeah. <laughs> Switzerland, Alpine country. Making PR tire the dog is a new variation, of course, yeah? <laughs> right, exactly. So how did the mom get him to sit down? How did the mom get him to sit down? It was just the father here that we, that we heard, yeah? <laughs> Baby's dad. So, so the father does something completely different. Yeah, he he steps back and looks at what is what is the son, my player, interested in. Yeah, and apparently he tries to reach his goal, his own goal, the father's goal, indirectly. Yeah, we've seen that. We've seen it with the complex video with this uh, stripper that with the girls. Yeah, the, the ladies on the on the on the on the bike. Uh, it was also indirectly that we went there. He steps back and looks, what is my son interested? What motivates him? And apparently this is something like cowboys. So what he does is he gives him visual feedback by gluing this cowboy on there. When he lifts the toilet seat, then he sees the drawn guns, the pee falls in there, you just have this hallmark card, which is audio feedback, and suddenly I have a story. I have a challenge. It's a completely different thing that's happening. It's not just I'm peeing, but it's a high noon situation that I have, and that's fun. Was he successful with that? 44%, four out of nine times, that's fantastic. Yeah, of course, there are always improvements, as we can see. Uh, so that was, the question is always, how long would it last? Yeah, uh, And that's where we need to create new levels. And we've seen this opportunity at the end. Yeah? The underpants not picked up, the toilet paper not, not changed. That is for gamification designer, that's a great thing because I can make this game run longer. Yeah. So you see the father step back and looked at what interests my son, what interests my employee, so to speak. Yeah. And through that, looked through that glass, he reached also his own goal. Why is gamification not working? So let's take a look at a couple of uh, scientific uh, things in the back. So there's one thing that's called flow theory. Mikhaili, Chikchen Mikhaili, He's Hungarian-born, a professor in the US, has been looking at uh, creativity. He has interviewed hundreds of Nobel Awards, with Nobel laureates, Pulitzer Prize winners, creative people, poets, artists, scientists, to figure out what makes them creative. And what he has seen is they talk about something, a phenomenon that they call flow zone. Yeah? So you may also know that thing. When you're really into something and you suddenly, uh, you dive in and for two or three hours you're just working. The work itself becomes the gratification, becomes the reward, yeah? And then you look at the clock, wow, wow, I saw shot 15 minutes ago and now it's three in the afternoon already. That's the flow zone. And what it means is it keeps the balance between the difficulty and the skill or the time that is required. Yeah. And at the beginning, you have often no skills. So when you, when you play Angry Birds, Angry Birds can be a very complex game, but at the beginning, the first time you play it, you don't know anything about that game. You don't know how it works. So you get only one type of bird. And with that type of bird, you start. And then you figure out, oh, it's a gravity thing. Yeah, I have to put this in the slingshot, and when I hit this thing and that thing here, it explodes, here it crashes it, and then I learn. And I play two or three levels, 
and then now my skills, my skills increase. That would bring me to this danger of becoming boring because it's not becoming more difficult. So the game now notches it up. Yeah, you get a second type of bird or, or more complicated targets to hit. And by keeping you in that frame all the time, you're in the flow. Then we talk about player types. Richard Bartle, a game designer and game theorist, figured out when he created the first multi-user dungeons back then in the 1980s, that these were these kind of first online games that you, that you had, that there were basically four types of people in, my, uh, in, in his game. One were the killers. Those are the people who want to win, who want to be on top of the leaderboard, who want the others to tell the others that they are the best and, and win. Then there were the achievers. Those are the people who want to select all the gold coins, get all the armory, get all the virtual goods in there. Uh, those are the people actually who may also in online games pay a lot of money to buy this specific spaceship or that Gucci branded bag in there because there are only five in this game and that costs $2,000 and I can show off. There are people who spend $100,000 or more in online games, in the same online game, the so-called whales. That's how into that they are. Then we have the explorers. The explorers are those people who wander around in this world, open every door, go in every house, open every drawer, go into every corner of that world, and once they're done with that, they log on as a different avatar because, for example, a mouse can go in the mouse hole while a cat avatar cannot. And then we have the socializers. The socializers are those type of people who play games just to meet others, even if this is just a computer-generated character. Yeah? For them, it's not about the game, really. It's about hanging out with others. Now, we're typically all four of those things, depending on time, how we feel, what kind of game that is. But if these were <clears throat> mutually exclusive traits, how many people do you think, how many players are killers? Give me a percentage number. What do you think? 20? 20? 10? 5? 5? Between 5 and 20 we have so far. Any other numbers? 5 to 20? Okay. Achievers. How many achievers do you think we have? 30 percent? 30? 30 to 50? Yeah. Okay. 30 to 50. So we have to have 100 percent at the end. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Explorers, how many explorers do we have? 15? 10, 10 to 15? Any other numbers? No? Socializers? The rest, which is how much? 20%. 20%. Any other numbers? 40, 20 to 40? Okay. So let's take a look at the real numbers, yeah? So in fact, it turns out that socializers are the majority of the people, 80%. Yeah? And in the workforce, uh, where we, you know, we build organizations to collaborate, because together we can achieve more as, as individuals, that's very important. So when I see gamification design that caters towards competition, you're basically setting up people who should collaborate to compete against each other, not collaborate. Yeah? Hiding stuff, uh, sabotaging maybe each other. Yeah? And, and only few people are actually participating in a competition. There's also a difference. In Western societies, women are much less competitive than men. Yeah? There are matriarchal societies where it's flipped, uh, where it's the other way around. But if we work in organizations, think of socializing. We collaborate. We want the people to work together and not uh, compete against each other. Now, here are some gamification design elements. Some of them you may be familiar or have heard. Here's one, the progress bar. We've seen it already in LinkedIn. Or you may know this application. This is Waze, a navigation application acquired by, by Google. Uh, what you see here is the avatars, depending on how many miles you report on the street that you drove in order to report traffic conditions. You can earn credits or points uh, in order to buy then an avatar that has a crown or uh, has a shield. So these are the other ways that are out there. You see here even hidden an Easter bunny, Easter, Easter bunny. So I took that snapshot a year ago at Easter. So if you drive over the Easter bunny, <coughs> you can earn more points in here. 
or you have your leaderboard. This is an Olympics leaderboard, so it's more sophisticated. It has the medals that the different countries uh, earned, or reputation or badges that we have. Or here, here's a game from the 80s that I played as a child. This is uh, when the world is calm in San Diego. So actually, it's a kind of a series. It was designed as a game, became a series game because you learned actual geography. Yeah? And I would have never known where Lima is. Yeah? Because it was so far away from, from where I live. Yeah? So these are a couple of gamification design elements. There are uh, probably about 200. I have a list on, on our wiki that is currently like uh, 70, oh, a little bit over 70. But there are elements such as being a hero. Yeah? Uh, honor is our design elements that are for some people really motivating. Uh, or uh, peer pressure, social, the social status that you have, or karma points, or just being silly, or laughing, or feedback that you get, or creating order out of chaos. I'm, I know that I'm kind of this guy collecting and creating order out of chaos because such a wiki, I work at the Wikipedia, I have this wiki, I try to kind of make sense of the world around me. Uh, you know, and teach that others. Take a look at another video. Salome has a problem. The summer heat is killing her. She is thinking of ways of how she can cool off. For instance, with a fan. But she is a cat. She wants others to work for her. Luckily, there is Rupert, the dog. She doesn't like him. But his wagging tail would be a perfect place for the fan. However, he is not going to do that for free. So she puts out an incentive. Tasty milk. But what's going on now? He is doing nothing. How about catnip? Salome loves that. But Rupert still doesn't show any reaction. How can she get Rupert to do what she wants? He doesn't like milk. He doesn't like catnip. So what does he like? A bone. Well, that works. He is wagging his tail, and she gets her cooling off. But after the third bone, Rupert stops wagging. He is full and doesn't feel rewarded anymore. Now Salome has an even better idea. She knows that he loves chasing squirrels and can do that for hours. So Salome makes a video of a squirrel and mounts a monitor on the treadmill. Then she puts Rupert on the treadmill and connects it to an electric fan. What a success! Salome has just learned that engaging Rupert with the wrong incentive does not work. An extrinsic reward works better, but only for a short time. But when she piques his interest, she is able to keep him engaged for a long time, and for her benefit. So the concept that we see here is uh, extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. Extrinsic rewards are something that come from outside of an individual. So if you, you know, reward a child for reading a book with a baseball card, this is an extrinsic reward. If you give them a sticker, uh, that's an extrinsic reward. If you pay a bonus to somebody for doing something in a timely manner, then this is an extrinsic reward. So people may also take shortcuts uh, to reach that goal. Yeah? Here are a couple of those uh, extrinsic motivators. If you, if you reward a child and want to get this child interested in reading a book, and you promise them for every book that this boy read a baseball card, what will happen? What do you think will happen? What kind of books will this boy select? The shortest ones with the largest fonts. Yeah? And if there are no baseball cards to earn anymore, he will stop reading, right? So he actually created the opposite of what he wanted. Yeah? You, are not, you did not interest the child into reading. So this is what uh, extrinsic rewards do. Now, I'm not talking here about in saying we should get rid of salaries. No, you need a salary, of course. That's, that's what you have. But there are other incentives that people do uh, that may actually be counterproductive. What we're looking at actually is something that is intrinsic motivation. So where it comes from inside an individual. Yeah? You are here uh, in this uh, school today, or you work for that organization, hopefully not because you're extrinsically motivated, 
but because of the intrinsic interest that you have in here to learn more, to, I don't know, serve your country, yeah, to protect your family, whatever it is, that's an ex intrinsic motivation that you have. So, so the elements such as belonging to, to a community, to have autonomy in what you're doing, to you know, have power maybe. Uh, power means in the community, for example, that you can do more than others for the benefit, hopefully, of that community. That you're on a mastery level. That there is a meaning, a higher meaning that you're part of in that. That you can learn that there's self-knowledge, sex, love, fun included in that as well. So these are the sources of motivation. Now, it does not mean that extrinsic motivators are all bad. They can actually be a Keeping tra helping you keep track of the intrinsic motivator. How well am I doing? Yeah, money in that sense is also just a, a tracker of how well you're doing to reach your intrinsic goals. Now think of yourself. Sixty years from now, you're on a deathbed. You've done. You've made peace that you're gonna die. Yeah. What will you remember at that moment? How many miles you collected uh, at United? How many stars, gold stars you earned? You were very much thinking of how many experiences I had, how many people and relationships I had, and they're all on the intrinsic side. So they're longer lasting and more powerful than those. We need those here as well to help us track the intrinsic ones. Let's take a look also at how now extrinsic motivators and rewards can actually wreak havoc with uh, certain things. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, and then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. I just see a question. The monkey on the left always got cucumber, while the monkey on the right got grapes. But the one who got the cucumbers, cucumbers, saw that that the other one got the grape and also wanted a grape. But the researcher didn't give her a grape, but only cucumbers, and that's why she was complaining. Yeah. So, so even with monkeys and animals, it works like that. There's a lot of research actually on that of how certain rewards actually can really make problems. There are monkeys working on little logs. Once you start rewarding them with raisins, they take less time on that. They make more errors. They're not really interested anymore. This is tested on children. Children in daycares who are, uh, you know, those who are selecting uh, their leisure time activities, uh, arts, creativity with ribbons and painting. And once they get rewarded with, with ribbons, these kids are not interested so much anymore in that leisure activity. The kids who did not get any ribbons, yeah, they just kept the same level of interest. Yeah. So, so there are tons of these examples out there that, that was tested on children, and adults, and monkeys, etc. that show always the same kind of effect of how rewards actually can interfere with interest in, in, in those activities. Now let me get now to some examples from the government or from uh, organizations such as yours that have used gamified approaches. Yeah? One of them that you may already know is uh, America's Army. Now that's a game, of course, first and foremost, Bill and Israel, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Good, very good. Uh, and that's uh, uh, an ego shooter where you learn about, you know, there are multiple things that are involved. You, you learn about the different units, you learn about weaponry, about tactics, etc. You play together. Uh, and it also helps to recruit yeah? because suddenly you see these, these good players, maybe they make good candidates for joining the army, uh, joining the military. 
then uh, the Royal Air Force uh, does that as well. They send you on different missions, uh, play a regi regiment gunner or play battle management or air cartographer to get people interested in a career at the Royal Air Force. GCHQ, the, the, the British Secret Service, uh, in order to apply for a job, you had to first crack that code. Yeah? Uh, decipher that code, can you crack it? They have another one, cybersecurity game right now out there in multiple levels that they play, where you also, only those people who come up with the correct code can apply for, uh, for a job. Uh, then games in financial industries uh, to detect uh, fraud. The Fraud Tycoon is a mobile game that helps to detect fraud patterns in the credit card industry. Or um, the European Union, uh, in order to train people on safety features and security features on banknotes, they created the so-called EuroCash Academy. It's just one game. They have like three or four games in order to teach their citizens on security features. Or uh, the accounted. Instead of learning accounting and bookkeeping, yeah, which is probably, for me at least, the, the most boring thing that you can ever imagine, uh, suddenly if you turn it around and say, you're actually the accountant for the mob, yeah, or you're, uh, the police officer going after the mob, uh, suddenly this turns into a story, it becomes interesting. Yeah, and people learn on the way uh, accounting. That was done by the Canadian CPA uh, Association. Um, then compliance. So if you want to uh, look at IT security uh, in a company, like banks have to do that, yeah, or other things, uh, this is probably the most boring thing ever to do, yeah, because you basically go through legal texts all the time, and then it doesn't really help you in your own work that you do right now, but you're required to do that, so nobody really likes doing that. But once you put them into a narrative, you are the kind of Miss Marple or Hercule Poirot or CSI Miami guy going after those bad guys. Suddenly, this boring compliance training turns into a crime story. What they do is, for example, you are the person who has in to investigate a, a fraud problem in your organ organization, uh, and you investigate and interview people, and then you know put the, piece, the, the puzzle pieces together. Uh, the same insider training. A uh, similar approach, also from the same company, actually. Uh, you find out who, who did the insider trading in that, in that thing. Uh, or a little bit less related, but this is more, or again, finding bugs in software systems. So that's called Bugs Premier League. There are a couple of the solutions out there from different countries that I've seen. Uh, how to get people, developers, to find the bugs and fix them. Uh, now imagine using that for fixing security holes and, and, and other things. What gamification tries to do is, and I've told you that already, it, <clears throat> it is more based on the meritocracy. It collects a lot of data on you, and in order to reward you, to level you up, it needs to know what you've done and what you've accomplished in order to reward you, to get you up. Uh, when you look at it from an organizational perspective, uh, and you put in gamification everywhere, uh, you collect a lot of data on employees and know their skills much better than before. So games such as World of Warcraft have that actually already. Yeah? They have these strengths and weakness charts, the stats, player stats that they have. We have billion dollar companies and organizations who don't have that detailed information on their employees than these games have. Yeah? And not only the, uh, on one player, but when you play now you know, a boss battle, you see here the data of all the players currently participating so that you know, okay, what's their, what's their, their strength status at the moment? Do we need to sky pull from the, from, the, from the dragon so that it's not dying? And do we need to bring somebody else in? Now, now think of that as working as a team. You are, you're working in teams. Uh, you may know of how well you're doing. And you may think, oh, I'm doing good. I have done all my stuff. But if the others are not doing well, you're also not doing well. The team is not winning. So this is, this gamification would help you to accomplish that. So if you want to do gamification, there are certain technologies available. Uh, some of them, a lot of these companies are actually based in the Bay Area on different uh, uh, spaces. So, so like, like Badge Wheel or uh, Bunchball, SAP has a solution, uh, Reptivity focused on CRM solution. I have uh, probably 100 of these technologies listed in for different spaces. 
that help you to plug them in into existing systems. So what we are doing, maybe talk about us, we are four people, we are gamification designers, we help with creating gamification designs, with giving you workshops, with uh, creating a larger vision on those things. I've also written a number of books, seven in total so far, on gamification. Uh, that is probably the, for a, a good entry uh, with 160 pages, very small. That's the large book, which really a lot of these details and sources and scientific research and then specific solutions for human resources, banking, financial, community innovation management. So if you want to share information amongst each other and how to encourage people to, to maintain this information, sales and support and also healthcare and, and fitness. Here's my contact information. If you have more in, um, requests, want more, want to know more, here it is.